Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Weekly Crop. And like last week, we are on location. Why? Because it's summertime and my kid's not in school, so someone has to look after him. Apparently, you cannot leave an eight-year-old by themselves, but you can lock the door. Needless to say, we are here to talk about the brand new Panasonic 1.2 firmware for their S1 camera, their full frame camera, not the S1R, but the S1. And there's a bunch of really exciting new updates for this camera. Uh, we're gonna hone in on one of those things predominantly, but let me run you through the list of all the changes that come with this brand new 1.2 firmware. Now it's a paid upgrade, so you have to pay some money for this thing. Uh, Panasonic has done this before, um, but it's not a huge amount of price. And I think it's well worth it, especially if you're a video shooter. Now. First off is improved internal body image stabilization, improved IBIS. And this is exciting because the S1 was already the best performing um, full frame IBIS out there as far as I was concerned. Based on some of our tests and what I've seen, it kind of outperformed just about everybody else. Uh, and they've improved that again. Um, so a lot of the footage that I've taken that you'll see in this video, in fact, if not all of it, is all handheld. I didn't use a gimbal, I didn't use a tripod, I didn't use a fluid head, nothing. I really wanted to see the limits of what this IBIS could do. The second thing is their autofocus. So traditionally autofocus hasn't been too great on these cameras and even the cameras that do really good autofocus and tracking, oftentimes they get really confused uh, with the foreground and the background. They, they kind of hunt back and forth between the two. Well, Panasonic solves this by now doing a far and a near autofocus. So you can set its priority, which means that if you've got a nice foreground element that you want to sort of shoot through, it won't try to hunt for that. It's only going to look at what's in the far field and vice versa if you wanted to shoot the front elements. So that's a really important and exciting upgrade and it works reliably well. Um, the next thing is there's some uh, inline performance improvements, uh, most notably writing to the XQT card. So there's some nice improvements there. It's when we started to get into the video that it gets quite exciting. With this particular case, you now get a 422 10-bit internal all the way up to 30p. And if you want 10-bit 422, you just gotta go external to a monitor for the 60p. Um, but all the way up to 30p at 4K, internal, full frame, that's bonkers. That's pretty impressive. And the things you can do with that now are really important. So one minor thing is they're giving you, they've given you a waveform monitor that is a 10-bit signal referenced waveform monitor. So that's great, again, for video shooters, super important. But the most important part of this update and what all of this is leading up to is their addition of V-Log. And this is not V-Log Lite like is found in the GH5 or GH4. It is the real, true V-Log that they use for the very cams. And what Panasonic is claiming is that you now get 14 plus stops of dynamic range like you get with the very cam, um, and you get that very cam color and science and, and look. We're gonna test that. We're gonna see how true that is because up until now, shooting log on a camera, on a mirrorless camera specifically, um, you could only get about 11 to maximum 12 stops of dynamic range. Uh, some of the cameras that shoot raw, like the 4K Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera, uh, shoots closer into the 12s, um, but that's shooting raw, right? We're talking about a compressed Kodak and a picture profile here. Very different ball game. So I'm very excited to test this out, to see what this log can do, because if this is gonna give me a very cam look with a full frame photo ready camera, we've got ourselves a winner on our hands. Not to sound like a broken record or anything, but I've said this in many other videos and it's worth repeating here, that log was not designed for an 8-bit signal. It was designed for a 10-bit or greater signal. And the reason is that when it redivides all the bits up and reassigns them, it doesn't really leave enough for things like skin tone or shadows and oftentimes uh, it robs you of compression noise because the camera's working so hard to kind of compress all this spread out data. Um, and so as a result, you often get a lot of artifacts with 8-bit log. Um, and this is sort of a stealing from Peter to pay to Paul kind of thing. Um, it just often doesn't work out. Now, can you get a great looking image from an 8-bit log system? Absolutely, I think Canon and Sony has particularly proved that that is true, you can. In an, an ideal situation, and oftentimes with a very good colorist, you can kind of get away with it. But it's when things are not ideal that generally the 8-bit system falls apart. Higher frame rates um, and uh, complex camera movements where the Kodak has to work harder to interpolate data. So 
This is why it's a big deal. To get a 10-bit signal and to get a true V-log means you're getting the most out of that sensor. So you're getting a camera that typically doesn't have this much dynamic range. Now, before we jump in, just a quick caveat that I used to own a GH4 and I sold it because I didn't love the colors of the GH4. Now, color is purely subjective uh, and there's a whole host of people on YouTube and on the internet that absolutely love Panasonic's color and will tell you why and show you examples. And remember that this is just a purely subjective opinion and also has a lot to do with things like your reference monitor and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, but for me, I'm not a huge fan of the colors uh, and particularly in the skin tones like magentas and reds tend to be a bit toxic and muddy as well as oranges tend to be really saturated. So uh, I kind of want to move on from that camera. Now, by contrast, where Panasonic nails it is with their EVA 1 and their Vericam line. Those two cinema cameras have incredible color. And I'm going to say something a bit outlandish here, but I find that the EVA 1 and the Vericam have a color and tonality that is more similar to an Ari Alexa um, than Sony's LC709 look that comes with their FS7 that is designed to match the Alexa. I get better skin tones and, and better performance out of those uh, EVA 1 and the Vericams. So really, really good color science there, which means that if they can get that color science in this small little full frame photo camera, you've got a killer product on your hands and it's going to just dominate the market. So let's find out if they're true or if they're pulling the wool over our eyes. For my first test, I grabbed my friend Tyler, who's a very accomplished musician here in Toronto, for a little performance in my living room. Now, I didn't use any stabilization on this other than what the camera comes with, so no gimbal, no tripod, purely handheld, uh, just to see what the IBIS can do in addition to the color signs that I'm testing here. Additionally, it's a very contrasty situation where I was trying to expose for the interior and the very sunny exterior, which is a challenge for just about any camera. I slapped on a Vericam V-Log LUT and then I massaged the levels ever so slightly. And what you notice right away is the fidelity of the dynamic range and the signal. It's clean. No magenta or cyan macro blocking that had plagued the GH4 and a bit to the GH5 or other 8-bit cameras. But then you look at the skin. And here we are again with the magenta skin tones. Now we're going to come back to Tyler to examine a few other things, but I want to examine skin tones a little further. I was on a fashion shoot recently and I asked our model Amanda if I could shoot a quick skin tone test with her. Pitting the Panasonic 10-bit S1 against the Sony a7 III 8-bit shooting S-Log2, the S1 fares considerably better than it did with Tyler. It still shows a bit of that classic Panasonic rich reds and magentas, and the LUT is quite contrasty as well. Doing my own custom grade, to even the playing field, you can see that there is more variance in color depth in her skin compared to Sony. But does that make it better? Well, I don't know. I think it's subjective. In the case of a perfectly exposed subject, I think it's kind of hard to tell if the 10-bit signal is outperforming Sony's 8-bit signal. Okay, so back to Tyler now. What if we underexposed? Now, this is the cardinal sin of log exposure, which is more of an exposed to the right edit. Log is designed to favor highlights, not shadows. So I did another side-by-side -side with Sony. You can immediately see the extra dynamic range with the S1. Sony has much deeper shadows and hotter highlights. Now, is this 14 stops we're seeing in the Panasonic S1 here? I don't know about that, but it's definitely at least two stops better than the Sony, and that's evident. Okay, so this is my verdict. Yes, the S1 V-Log is what it promises. Enhanced dynamic range and performance. Now, is it a Vericam? Not even close, in my opinion. Maybe what I should do actually this summer if I find some time is to actually pit this camera against the GH5, the EVA 1 and the Vericam. We can get a more holistic look at how these cameras perform along the line and which colors match which. So look for that. I'm going to try to find some time to do that. Um, but in the meantime, if you are a fan of the GH5 color, then this is your camera, this is your firmware, and this is me saying thanks for watching and happy shooting. Peace!